Well, hello, friends. I want to welcome you again to another one of our broadcasts for our Holy Week service here on Palm Sunday. You know, we're beginning now our second month of these kind of virtual church services since we've been unable to gather personally. I'm glad that you're joining with me, and I hope that you're doing well during these times of homebound restrictions. We are going to share together today, as I have in weeks past, and uh, we're going to continue to do that up through Easter now. In fact, speaking of Easter, uh, we have a very special a virtual Easter service planned for next Sunday. I hope you'll plan to tune in uh, as a, with a friend or individually or as a family. It won't be a live service, but we're going to do our best to stitch it together and make it something that you'll enjoy. It will be a little bit unique, maybe different than what you've experienced before. But we want to encourage you to be a part of that and maybe invite someone to join you as well. And then also this week, called Holy Week on the church calendar, beginning tomorrow morning on Monday, uh, every day we're going to be sharing just a, another five or six minute little reflection or devotional with you, uh, kind of a thought of each day as we track through the final week of Jesus' life, some of the events that he encountered and engaged in, and the significance of those for our own lives. So I hope that you'll tune into that. All of these will be on our Facebook page, and then we'll, that will link, of course, to being able to watch those on YouTube. But today is Palm Sunday, so named, of course, because of some of the events that took place on that Sunday. We'll be looking at those in just a few minutes. But for Jesus, this entry into Jerusalem would become a, a game-changing event in many ways. And he knew it would be leading up to the final big event, of course, of his crucifixion and resurrection on that following Sunday. And so for a few minutes today, I wanted to, us to take a look and consider that historic event of Palm Sunday. We find it in all of the Gospels, but particularly the one I want to read for us today is found in Mark chapter 11. And we pick up the story in verse 7, where Jesus returns to Jerusalem on the donkey that he had, the colt of a donkey that he had prepared for his disciples to secure, and now he will be riding into the city on that. And so Mark records it for us like this in verse 7. He begins, And then they, the disciples, brought the colt to Jesus, and threw their garments over it, and he sat on it. Many in the crowd spread their garments on the road ahead of him, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut in the fields. Jesus was in the center of the procession. The people were all around him and were shouting, Praise God! Blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessings on the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Praise God in highest heaven. Well, if that event is, happens to be new to you, it's not just Palm Sunday, but it's come to be known as the Triumphal Entry because of the palm branches that were spread on the road and the people's praise and singing. Uh, palm Sunday has become one of those special events in the church calendar. It's just a week away from Easter. But the line between those two events, Palm Sunday and Easter, is one of the most convoluted lines in the Bible. The same crowd that welcomed him on Palm Sunday and hailed him as the coming king, just a week later, would be the crowd that calls for his execution, crucifixion. You see, this day that Jesus entered into Jerusalem was one that the Jews had longed for for centuries. It was foretold in the Old Testament thousand years before that in the book of Psalms. As they cried out, the psalm writer, for God to send a deliverer. And so this day, Palm Sunday, marked for what the Jews thought would be the day of salvation that they had longed for, that they had been told about and prayed about and prayed for for centuries. Because they thought it would be the day that Jesus would inaugurate delivering them, rescuing them from their Roman oppressors. You see, at this period in their history, the Jews labored under the, the crippling hand of the Roman Empire. But they had not given up change. 
that there might be, or given up hope that there might be a change, a regime change, despite the crippling presence of the Romans. They could still recite the ancient prophecies from the Old Testament that someday an anointed one, a savior would come, the king. A new king would ride into Jerusalem to deliver his people. That's what the prophet Zechariah wrote about when he prophesied many centuries before that, perhaps a prophecy that you recall in Zechariah 9, he said, Rejoice, O people of Zion. Shout in triumph, O people of Jerusalem. Look, your king is coming to you. He's righteous and victorious, yet he's humble, riding on a donkey, riding on a donkey's colt. And so while the Romans watched the triumphal entry cautiously, the Jews waited expectantly, optimistically, wondering, could this be the day that Zechariah had prophesied? Could Jesus be their new king riding into Jerusalem to release them from the oppression of the Romans? And so as Jesus neared the city, the the people began to cry out as they laid their cloaks and the palm branches before him, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna was a cry from that Psalm 118 that I referred to a few moments ago, a cry that means save us, Lord, save us, deliver us. And here it expresses their hope that they would now have God's anointed one come and deliver them from the Roman tyranny. But the Jews were about to learn two lessons that were really unexpected. Lessons from these Palm Sunday events that they never would have foreseen. The first came the next day after Jesus entered Jerusalem. But instead of heading directly to the Roman forts to begin their deliverance, known as the Antonia Fortress, there in the city of Jerusalem, right next to the, the temple. Suddenly, as Jesus entered the city, he turned left instead of right, heading not to the fortress, but to the Jewish temple. And Mark records for us what would happen next as Jesus entered the city and went to the temple. In verse 15 of Mark 11, he says, when they arrived back in Jerusalem, this being the next day, Jesus entered the temple and he began to drive out the people buying and selling animals for sacrifices. He knocked over the tables of the money changers and the chairs of those selling doves. And he stopped everyone from using the temple as a marketplace. And he said to them, the scriptures declare, my temple will be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have turned it into a den of thieves. You see, rather than going directly to the Antonio Fortress, the heart of the Roman occupation, Jesus went to the Jewish temple. That's the heart of the Jewish nation. And the significance of that is enormous. And the repercussions of it are still felt to this day by Jews and Gentiles, even us today in the 21st century. Because by going to the temple instead of the fortress, Jesus showed that his liberation would be of a spiritual nature, not political, as the Jews had expected. He was bringing salvation to people's souls, not to the nation of Israel in their sovereignty. And it won't be until Jesus returns a second time at the end of this age that he will come back as the conquering king over all the nations. That's when, according to the New Testament, Every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. But in this, his first coming, it was to be a spiritual deliverance, not political. He came to set people free from what binds their hearts, freedom from what oppresses us from within. He came to offer forgiveness and release from sin, coupled with his mercy and grace for living life. You see, before he could become the conquering Messiah, he must first be the suffering Messiah. 
and die on a cross to pay the penalty for our sins. And that was a very unexpected lesson for the Jews. He was not the conquering Messiah, but he would be the suffering Messiah, come to give release and freedom from their, for their hearts. And a second lesson that the Jews learned unexpectedly is that Jesus came to confront ungodliness in the hearts of all people, not just the Jews. If we delved into this more deeply, we'd understand that by attacking the money changers in the temple, Jesus was showing that his salvation focused on the heart and cleansing it of anything that keeps a person separated from God. And so taking those two lessons and putting them together, they teach us that Jesus came to break down the walls that separate us, all people, from God. You see, Jesus, he came with his agenda, not ours. And we often think that Jesus is going to be for us and against those evil people who oppose us. But in reality, he loves all people. The Bible says that God so loved the world that he gave his son. And so in reality, Jesus was not against any people, but he's against sin wherever he finds it. He's out to destroy anything that separates people from God and distorts our authentic relationship with him. And so what we learn from Palm Sunday and the events that week leading up to the crucifixion is that Jesus wants to remove the things in our lives that keep us from knowing him and experiencing his love every day in our lives. And I wonder if Jesus rode into our town today. Do you think, where would he go? What would he do? I'll tell you, according to what we saw from Palm Sunday events, he would go after any practice that keeps outsiders feeling like outsiders. Any practice that tells someone they aren't good enough to be part of the church. And I'm glad he'd do that. You know why? Because none of us, not one, is good enough to be in his family. In and of ourselves, we're all outsiders. None of us belong. We only get in because of God's grace. It says, come one, come all. Let me show you the salvation that I can bring to your life and the release I can give to you, to your sin. And today, listening to me, I know are many who weren't afraid to cry out with the crowd on that Palm Sunday, Hosanna, save me. You've made that decision to give Jesus your heart and to invite him into your life and to receive him as your king, your savior. And that's exactly what Jesus wants to do in all of our lives. And perhaps you're listening to my words today and you say, I never experienced that. I never understood why it was that Jesus came. Let me tell you, he wants to forgive you of your sin and to free you from your brokenness. He wants to deliver us from the habits and the practices that bind us from a relationship with him and keep us from enjoying the relationships with those around us. To show us every day how life works best when we live it according to God's way and the difference that he can make in each of our lives. So let me ask you, if Jesus rode into your life today, are you ready for the difference that would make? Are you willing to let him define your a new relationship with him and with God himself? He does that as we receive him into our lives. He redefines a relationship that we have with him a relationship that is now free and forgiven. And there's no judgment, no condemnation. And he sets us free, free to be all that God wants us to be. Are you ready for a relationship like that? Are you experiencing the joy and the freedom and the fullness of that? A relationship that breaks you free from the addictions that may have gripped your life 
or the brokenness in your life that just won't seem to heal or memories that you can't shake or greed that you don't want to admit or the unforgiveness that you experience toward yourself and refuse to offer to others or the fear that you just can't get over and release or the anger that you can't let go of or the rebellion that you won't confront or the anger or the shame that uh, you can't shake or the guilt that you can't be free of or the pride that you won't recognize. You see, whatever it is that holds us back and keeps us from a relationship with God and living in the fullness of that relationship, when Jesus comes to town and we receive him into our lives, he promises to set us free from the things that keep us from him and experiencing the joy of the, and the depth of that relationship, of growing in it, and then inviting others to grow in and experience that relationship as well. I hope that these little reflections today give you a new perspective on Palm Sunday. I appreciate you listening in. I, I hope that you live in the freedom that Jesus wants to bring to your life. Freedom to be all that God wants you to be as you receive him into your life and as you receive his joy and his freedom to be what God has designed you to be. Thanks for listening in. You can enter any comments you want or questions and we'll respond to those. And I encourage you to share this with others, invite others to be together with us as well. We look forward to having you join us again next Sunday on Easter for our special webcast. And to tune in beginning tomorrow morning, each day this week, for a special Holy Week reflection that we'll be sharing with you daily on the church web's uh, a Facebook, Facebook page. And you can enter in and join uh, with us on that as your schedule allows each day this week. And if you'd like to know more, maybe you're listening today for the first time, and you'd like to know more about this new relationship with God that Jesus offers when he came into the world and through his death on the cross and his resurrection. If you'd like to know more about that, I encourage you to reach out to us on our Facebook page or website or email me directly at pastor at avianobaptist.church. I'm Gary Preston, here today as the interim pastor at Aviano Baptist Church, and so glad you've joined us. I hope you'll invite someone to be a part of our gathering next Sunday on Easter Sunday through our webcast as well. Until then, God bless you. Keep in touch. Keep connected with your church family. Stay safe and reach out to God's love. Thanks for joining us. God bless you.